Boy, do I have a story for you. All right. It's almost Easter, uh, and what just passed in the Jehovah's Witness religion is their, the closest thing that they have to a holiday. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't do birthdays, they don't do Christmas, they don't do Easter, they don't do any kind of holidays because they think that they're all pagan. Uh, but the closest thing that they have to a holiday is what they call their memorial service, and that just happened. If you don't know all that much about Jehovah's Witnesses, well, I'll give you a bit of a rundown of what they believe. So, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus is God, yet they still call themselves Christians, which is strange. But they tend to follow, they tend to say that they follow Christ in that he pointed them to God. And so they think he's just a good teacher or that he was just a good man, but he showed people how to please Jehovah, essentially. And they think that Jehovah's um, true church, if you would like to say, is their watchtower organization. So it was started by a guy named Charles Taze Russell uh, about 150 years ago, I think, something like that. And he started a society called the Bible, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Well, it was either him or one of his successors that started the organization. And then that is what is now known as just the Watchtower. And then that has the governing body, which overlooks all of the Jehovah's Witnesses around the world. And I think it's 12 guys. And they essentially are the word of God to everybody else. One of the things that they do every year is their version of communion. So with a regular church, you might have communion every week if you're something like a Lutheran or every once in a while if you're a Baptist or something like that. But with Jehovah's Witnesses, they only have it once a year. And this really isn't the communion that you're thinking of. Communion in the Jehovah's Witness religion is kind of weird. So I'll just describe what I saw when I went there, and you can take it for what it is. So I go to the Kingdom Hall. It was about 7 o'clock, and I met my friend there, and then we walked in. And one of the things that I noticed about this place is everybody that could came up to me and said hi and shook my hand and introduced themselves. They were super nice. Um, they were super inviting. They were glad that I was there. And I can't say for sure if they were just putting on a face or if they genuinely meant it, but it seemed genuine to me, at least, for the most part. Um, and so they were just really excited for me to be there. I also kind of felt out of place because I was dressed kind of like this and everybody else was dressed really nice. Not only are they told to dress really nice all the time, but this is like their special occasion once a year, so everybody dressed super nice. And there I was in jeans and a t-shirt and a jacket. So, oh well. Um, but anyway, we sit down and they do some songs and then they have a, a speaker come up. It's not a pastor, it's a speaker. And it's not a sermon, it's like just a public talk. And he talks about um, some passages from scripture related to their communion and what heaven will be like and what what they call the earthly paradise will be like. Um, but they have this concept of the 144,000 people. So the 144,000 represents 12,000 people from every of the 12 tribes in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, it's symbolic of that where John in Revelation is writing about the 144,000 uh, essentially ruling with Christ in heaven. And they take it to mean a literal thing where it's actually literally 144,000 people, but they're not ancient Jews where the number originates from. They're people of Jehovah's faith that started in the time of Christ up until now. And some friends of mine did some math and that equates to, well, if the 144,000 have been essentially chosen from the time of Christ until now, that's about 70 people per year when there's billions of people on the earth and millions of Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's very rare uh, for anybody to be considered part of the 144,000. But they were talking about how you would know if you're part of the 144,000. And to Jehovah's Witnesses, the Holy Spirit is not a personal 
being like he is in Christianity. It's just God's Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God as in like an, an impersonal force. And apparently in Romans, I think it was Romans 5, it talks about the Holy Spirit testifying to the fact that we are children of God, meaning that the Holy Spirit tells you that you're a child of God. They take that to mean the, whole, the impersonal Holy Spirit of God can tell you that you are one of God's children, which I guess refers to them being 144,000 or of the 144,000, because they then linked that to Revelation talking about these people. And the idea of it in the afterlife is you don't have just everybody going to heaven. You have two, what they call two hopes. So the first hope is the 144,000 who end up going to heaven. And I think it's a spiritual thing. It's not actually physical. They're spiritually there with Jesus ruling the earth or maybe just with Jehovah, but they're ruling the earth from above. And then the second hope is everybody else that's in Jehovah's organization that goes to uh, the earthly paradise. I don't know why, but apparently the, the year 1934 is the end of the last generation. So anybody born up until 1934 from some time before then is part of the last generation. Um, and once those people die off, we will enter the last days. And you can imagine, if it's 1934 and we're in 2024, that is 90 years. So people born at the very latest in 1934 are very old now. And once those people die off, apparently we'll be entering the last days and the earth is soon to end. And they really believe that. They think, oh yeah, we're really getting down to the line here. And so about this last generation, anybody born from the time of Christ until the modern day, until the end of days, can be one of the 144,000 that will go to heaven and rule with Christ. They don't have to be a part of this last generation. So the connection between all this stuff is the communion service that they have includes wine and bread that they pass around to everybody. And in passing it around, they're essentially like searching for the people who are part of this group of 144,000. And so if you take the bread and eat it, or you drink the wine and, and drink it, or you take the wine and drink it, you are declaring yourself as one of the 144,000. And so that's a big deal. And so the fact that we had one guy there tonight that declared himself like that was a really big deal. So they just told me, hey, don't, don't take this, um, just pass it along. And I was really considering taking it just to see what would happen. <laughs> and I honestly don't know what would happen. Um, one of the people I was there with later on said, how arrogant does this guy think he is? Or how arrogant is this guy actually? How prideful do you have to be to just know or just assume that you're good enough to be part of the 144,000? And do the other people really think that he is so good to be part of that? I don't really know. Um, I don't know the guy's life. I've never even met him. I've barely even met any of these people, but that seems like a really big stretch. But anyway, that's what they've been told. And a lot of these people have been in it since birth. So that's all they really know. The guy that I was introduced to, one of the Jehovah's Witnesses there, introduced me to his dad, who had been a part of it for a long time. So you can see it's a, it's a familial thing. It's not just a bunch of outsiders who come and convert. It's There's a big family aspect to it. Same with Mormonism, by the way. So when I was sitting there in the congregation listening to this message, I couldn't help but look around and think about the people that were a part of this and what their fate was. If you're a Christian and you know who Christ is and you know what he's done to save you, when you see people that are outright blaspheming against that, you can't help but feel sorrow. You can't help but feel sad or like there's darkness in the room or something because I was sitting about three or four rows back from the front and there were two, uh, two sides along the, on, along either side of the, the center aisle. And on the other side of this aisle, all the way at the front was this dad and mom and I think three kids. And I couldn't help thinking this dad, which the Bible tells us 
dads are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the family. This dad is leading his family down the wrong path, and they're just eating it up. When the host came up to the stage at the end, he said that they were very happy to have 197 people in attendance. And there was me and a couple other visitors, I don't know exactly how many, but the vast majority of them were Jehovah's Witnesses. And they not only said that, they said, we have to get out of the parking lot quickly because there's actually another service coming in right after us. And I was just thinking, I know that there's kingdom halls all over the world and there's two services going on in this building and there's 197 people at this one. That must mean across the world, there's an immense number of people that are all a part of this. And just like that family that I was looking at earlier, they are all going down this wrong path. And so that was really, really disturbing. The friend that I went with said he had heard on the cultish podcast that there's this idea of America having a spiritual debt. So Jehovah's Witnessism started in America and it spread around the world. But apparently when it was really early on in America, there was a chance for the, the church to actually quash it and quell it and stop it before it, it grew into anything. But the church didn't do anything. So now we have this spiritual debt of all of these people who are being led down the wrong path because we didn't do anything to help them out or to stop them from going down this wrong path. One last thing. In 1975, there was a big exodus from the church, Church of Jehovah's Witnesses, because they had said that that was the year when the world was going to end, and then obviously it didn't. So a lot of people really got disillusioned because they were panicking, thinking the world was about to end, and then it didn't. So the people that told them the world was about to end were evil in their eyes, and so they left. And I remember the guy that I was talking to last night genuinely believed that the world was going to end very soon. And if the people of the last generation die off soon, and then we enter the last days, it's probably not long within the last days until the world actually ends. So you're looking at maybe like 20, 30, 40 years, maybe, before apparently the world is supposed to end. And one of the things I couldn't help thinking on the way home was, I hope that I can talk to some Jehovah's Witnesses and make this a regular thing and keep doing it throughout my life so that when this day happens, this 20 year, 30 year, 40 year time from now, when the world's supposed to end, when that actually doesn't happen, I can be there for the Jehovah's Witnesses to essentially catch them when they fall because so many of them are going to leave the church if that's the case. What ends up happening a lot is Jehovah's Witnesses will leave this religion, but they can't separate the person of Jesus from the religion of the Watchtower. So they throw both of them out and they end up becoming an atheist or like a really liberal Christian or a new ager or something like that. Uh, but they don't actually have a relationship with Jesus because they threw him out with the watchtower. And so I really hope that they don't do that, but I can only help so many people. So I hope this video finds you well, and I will see you next time.